Hello and welcome back. Let's get more now on uh, tonight's reported crash. We can speak to the former senior British military intelligence and security officer, Philip Ingram. Philip, a uh, good speak with you and good evening. Now, let's just remind uh, our viewers of the uh, details that are coming from the Russian Civil Aviation Authority reporting that Yevgeny Prigozhin and Dmitry Utkin were, in fact, on board the plane, but there is something missing in that report, isn't there, saying that they were dead? Well, uh, they've, they've put a list of passengers that were on the plane um, and it hasn't said that those passengers have been confirmed dead. That, that's the, clearly the manifest of individuals that were supposed to be on it or that the Russian authorities uh, had said they were on it in the first place. You know, as um, Professor Michael Clark said, you know, any of the Russian um, uh, government agencies are also big sources of disinformation. Um, and we will get lots of information, disinformation around this until um, we, we start to get more confirmed um, uh, evidence of uh, the bodies that are there. And that will be backed up by what's coming out of the intelligence agencies and governments um, in the West. Uh, so, Philip, talk to us about how uh, Western intelligence agencies will go about in the next uh, uh, hours and days and perhaps weeks ahead trying to verify exactly what has taken place here. Well, there, there's one thing that we know. Um, an aircraft has crashed and possibly been shot down uh, in, a, in a part of uh, Russia very near Moscow because uh, we've seen the pictures. The Russians have reported it. We can see the burning aircraft on the ground. So that gives a start point for the intelligence agencies to look at what was flying in the area at the time. And uh, Western intelligence has got a lot of um, uh, capabilities that are monitoring uh, the airspace over Russia almost continuously. Um, you can then dial back from that and start to look at where the flight started and where uh, the flight was supposed to be going to, um, who was on the manifest, and the Russian Aviation Authority have told us quite conveniently who was on the manifest, uh, and then to try and confirm uh, whether individuals um, that were on the manifest actually got onto the aircraft or not. Um, and there will be um, secret methods of, of uh, trying to confirm that um, and less secret methods of looking at what's in the press and looking at what's in social media uh, and everything else and bringing all of that together to try and build a coherent picture. So that'll be going on as we speak. Um, the, the reporting that we're seeing across the wider Telegram channels and uh, you know, I caveat Telegram here as one of the biggest sources of disinformation that we get around um, what's going on inside Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, but the volume of reporting and from a number of different channels and the comments that have been putting on, um, if I was to make a judgment call at the moment, I'd say it's probably slightly more likely than less likely that Prigozhin um, and Utkin, um, his sidekick, were on the aircraft. Yeah, and while we're talking, uh, Philip, we're looking at the footage of what seems to be a burning wreckage of that jet. I wonder, this is obviously um, user-generated content, it's shot on a mobile phone. How useful is that to the intelligence services to try and examine this sort of material? Extremely useful because you know, they, they'll be able to sit down and um, when, whenever the cameras pan back and look at it, there are some features that they'll then be able to geolocate. Uh, they'll be able to confirm um, all, of, all of that. You know, they will be able to analyze the detail of the picture. And we can see here the aircraft tumbling down to the ground. There were very early reports of two explosions uh, before the aircraft tumbled out of the air. Um, and then um, you know, that, that tar facility that's there um, behind the, the uh, slightly domed um, uh, uh, structure will be able to be geolocated fairly rapidly and fairly easily. So that all of that will add to uh, you've been able to build this wider picture. Um, and um, you know, if it has been proven that has been uh, uh, that Prigozhin has been shot down, you know, it's almost certain that this will have been sanctioned at the highest levels. Yeah, and Philip, on that then, and who may well have been behind this, what does this do to the uh, the effort, the war effort that's being conducted? Of by uh, the Russians. How much impact will this have? Uh, will it change in any way the way they prosecute this war? The, the, the tactical operations that are going on the, on the ground inside Ukraine, no, it'll have virtually no effect whatsoever on there. Um, it's the higher operational and strategic level uh, that's going on. Your Prigozhin's uh, attempted coup, if it was an attempted coup, um, uh, embarrassed Putin. But actually, Prigozhin was overstepping his mark um, from a much earlier stage. He'd been openly critical of the Defence Minister Shoigu, the tactics that Shoigu and the overall commander into Ukraine, General Gerasimov, were showing, um, and the support that the Wagner troops were getting in their assaults into Bakhmut. Um, and whilst he was being openly critical of those in the Ministry of Defence and in the military, he was also um, 
getting statements out there that were suggesting that he had wider political ambitions, mm. potentially to take over from Vladimir Putin at some stage in the future. That is when Vladimir Putin will have started to go, Prigozhin's overstepped his mark, I made him, he should be um, supporting me an awful lot more than he's doing. He shouldn't be criticising my senior staff. Uh, and that's when Putin will have started to deal with a little bit of a plan to um, push Prigozhin out, but also to identify Prigozhin's supporters. Um, and one of the, his major supporters was General Armageddon, um, General uh, Surovikin, who used to command the Russian forces inside Ukraine, was then made a deputy commander to Gerasimov, and after the Prigozhin attempted coup, has disappeared completely and was allegedly sacked from being head of the Russian Air Force today. Yeah, it was just removed, and uh, Professor Clark tells me he may well be on holiday uh, at the moment. We're not entirely sure where Surovikin is, because you rightly mentioned he hasn't been seen since he gave what seems to be a sort of a hostage video asking um, uh, Prigozhin to turn his troops around on that day of the yeah. coup. And, and there's, a, there's a number of senior personnel that have disappeared. You've only seen Shoigu on a couple of occasions. We've only seen Gerasimov on one or two occasions. We haven't seen Patrushchev, who is the um, chairman of the Russian... Um, Security Committee, National Security Committee. He's responsible for security um, inside Russia itself. He is effectively the, the, the person that's feeding Vladimir Putin all, all of the detail uh, and is what you would have been Putin's right-hand man, a natural successor, a former head of um, uh, Russian, Russian intelligence services, the, the FSB. Um, uh, and he's disappeared completely um, ever since that attempted coup. There's a lot going on in the background that we don't know about. And a lot of this isn't just within the political sphere underpinning all of it are the wider criminal networks that are exploiting the natural resources in Africa that are um, funding the oligarchs, funding Vladimir Putin. It's all built on this foundation of criminality um, that is underpinned by the, the state uh, that is Russia. Yeah, and oftentimes when we do see these people pop up in video, it's uh, impossible to know when that video was shot, yeah. which sort of adds to the misinformation and the sort of the opaque nature of what's actually going on behind the curtain there in Russia. Just talk to us a little bit, if you can, Philip, before we listen to uh, Christopher Steele um, telling us his thoughts about what may have happened, what may well happen now to the Wagner Group in its operations, as we were saying earlier, many of their troops are in Belarus, of course. We know that they're active in Africa. And the last time we saw Yevgeny Prigozhin, he purportedly was in Africa with his troops. Well, this, this is an interesting question. Um, Vladimir Putin, he probably didn't um, take action against Prigozhin so early on because of the influence that Prigozhin had, in particular into Africa, um, and getting the, the funding that's needed for, for the oligarchs to work. Um, Putin will have done as much as he can to try and set the conditions to take over Wagner operations in Africa and elsewhere. Um, or has got to the point where he feels there's nothing else he can do and needs to send a very clear message. And that's when he's ordered um, Prigozhin to be removed. Um, I understand reading again through a number of different channels that um, uh, the, the new command structure of the Wagner Group are um, going to make a statement fairly soon. It'll be interesting to see what they say. They will either have been subjugated and, and come under uh, a new command and control structure that Vladimir Putin has managed to get into place, or they're going to be very anti it. And this is where there's some powerful people around with you know, Surovikin in particular and some of the, those that are associated with him uh, and you know, the, the, the influence that Wagner has in Africa and elsewhere. And that influence has got political influence back into Moscow again. So you know, this whole relationship with Wagner is going to be fascinating. We could see further destabilization in Russia. We could see even more destabilization across the areas that they're influencing inside Africa, which would cause the international community an even bigger headache. Absolutely right. Okay, uh, Philip Ingram, do appreciate that analysis and expertise. Thank you for now.